A lot of news on the Trump transition front. The president-elect has picked KT McFarland to be his deputy national security advisor and former FEC chairman Don McGahn as his White House counsel. We're going to have more on that later in the show, but first, a heated battle is apparently brewing within the Trump team about the secretary of state position. Former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney is reportedly being considered for the job. But some of the president-elect's closest supporters are expressing concerns about Romney, pointing to a sharp criticism of Mr. Trump during the election. Trump's senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway, weighing in on Twitter, quote, Kissinger and Schultz as secretaries of state flew around the world less, counseled POTUS close to home more, and were loyal. Good checklist. Others close to the president-elect have mixed reactions. He probably needs to say that more publicly, and I think a lot of the, uh, the strife would dissipate at that point. What I love about Mr. Trump, the president-elect, is that he has got a bridge open to everybody in the community. He sent a message to us at the executive transition team level that we want A-plus-plus players on the team, and Governor Romney is an A-plus-plus player. Communications are afoot, Dana. Mm -hmm. So what do you make of sort of the mixed messages? Obviously, the press saying there's some internal conflict over this, real uh, specifically very hardcore like Trump loyalists saying this isn't someone you should pick. Then you've got like the Rudy camp, the Mitt camp, and then Kelly weighing in. Well, one of the things that's different from previous administrations and transition teams is that this is not being done behind the scenes. It's not like they're backstabbing. They're actually on the record saying this. So that mm -hmm. actually, I guess if you, that's a, just a different way of doing things, but it's not like they're um, hiding their true feelings and they're on the record. Like if you tweet something or if you go on Fox News and you mm -hmm. say these things, like you are trying to weigh in. And I think what I would imagine is that that kind of argumentation amongst a group of advisors is encouraged from the top. I don't think if, if Donald Trump were upset that people were actually arguing about this in public, I think it would stop like that. Right. So I imagine that he's probably okay with it. He may also want to see how people react to yeah. that. I mean, there's clearly an understandable reflection from the folks that have been pro-Trump for a long time to someone like Romney who trashed him yep. for so long. Now he's got an opportunity. I also does, do think it speaks to the president-elect. And this is a guy who made decisions when he had to mm -hmm. about moving out um, Governor Christie and bringing in Pence at the begin with. He picked you know, Flynn and Sessions, Pompeo quickly before many other presidents had. But on this one, he's probably conflicted. He had a good meeting with Romney, felt like he's a smart guy, even after what he's done, but he's loyal to, uh, to Giuliani. Then he hears other names like Petraeus uh, and general, uh, the other general that's out there as well, Kelly, mm -hmm. who's a thoughtful guy. He's probably saying, hey, let's see how this plays out. I've got a little bit of time. Well, yeah. can I just float a really um, interesting theory, which I don't know if I subscribe to, but it's Friday. 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 Yeah. But it's Friday. But it's Friday. I'm going to throw it out it's anyway. It's the holidays. Yes. It, it is possible that he's leaving Romney out there to dangle and to be killed by a thousand cuts because Romney was incredibly unkind to him in his view during the election. And the reason he's doing this is to make Romney appear that he's groveling for a job, that he never has any intention of actually giving Mitt Romney. Hmm. And he's having all these other people come out and talk about what a horrible, horrible human being Mitt Romney was to the president-elect. And the president-elect knows that he's not going to choose Romney, but he's having Romney jump through 20,000 hoops in the attempt to get the job. And ultimately, I suspect, though I would love to see Mitt Romney Secretary of State because other people that are being considered, like Rudy Giuliani, I think are just unacceptable. I don't think Mitt Romney's going to get this job. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm You've pleasantly wrong. You've been reading Art of War lately, I think. I've been, I've been or, or some gossip blogs, I'm not sure. Or some high school, or some, yeah. or some high school girl that gossip is, blogs, yeah. right. Well, it's an interesting Tommy. theory, Julie, but is he really jumping through hoops? I don't see Romney as kind of demeaning himself. He went in, he took a meeting. He's not, I don't think he's going to do this he's apology. Not, not a word. Yes, he hasn't he's said anything. Work. And I don't think he should apologize. There's no reason to apologize. He, he would probably want to explain himself. Like, this is what I thought about Trump. This is honestly what I thought. And this is why I'm willing to work with him now. But I don't think he has to but apologize. But he's going to have to, right? He's going if, yes. if he takes the job, the first question will be either at a Senate confirmation hearing or even from the press beforehand. Governor Romney, why did you think that Donald Trump was completely unfit to be president of the United States and all the horrible names that you called him over the last 18 months, if not a little less, why now, why now, Governor, do you think that you will work for this man that you think is wholly unqualified to be president? He's going to have to say something that's going to sound like an apology. And the question for Romney is, is he willing to do that? And what has changed? Why would he even go to Bedminster last weekend and shake the hand and try to interview with the man that he thinks is totally unqualified to be commander in chief? I don't know the answer to that. Because he wants to serve the country. Well, I don't know. Dana, what is, what's think, the answer to that question? If he goes I think the answer is kind of easy. Mm -hmm. I think that because Romney was himself at the beginning of this, and so this is what I think, I think that going to Bedminster was partly because, well, I don't really know. I've not talked to anybody on his team or, or to him, obviously. But um, to me, it looked like a moment of patriotic grace, yep. of being able to say, okay, obviously, he won, and in a fashion that I couldn't. 
So uh, if I believe in public service, and I think Governor Romney does, I think that he could come up with something that says, fine, yes. He could give one press conference, answer all of those questions, in a confirmation hearing, have the Democrats say, read back all of his words to him and just mm -hmm. say, you're right, I said that. And now I'm ready to serve and in a way that there would be no daylight between Donald Trump and me. Is that enough for an apology? I don't even have a, 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 a problem doing, doing what you're saying. No. I mean, he's an honorable man. A great I actually think there's I a... Think, I could do it. And yeah. I think there's a lot of people... <laughs> <laughs> what if what no, if, I'm not saying I want to do it. I'm just saying... <laughs> if Department you of Interior if you wants me, all the parks. <laughs> yeah, right now. Parks are, <laughs> but if you gave me that challenge, the communications challenge, and because if I believed it, it's not hard to do a press conference like that if you actually believe what I just said. Sure. I don't know if that's all true, but right. if you do believe that, then it's not difficult. I think, I think he could. He could make the kind of statement where he, he, he's, uh, the patriotic grace that you, you, you're giving him, I think, is authentic. He could have that come across. But I also think Donald Trump is giving patriotic grace back to him. I yeah. think this is a guy who, two and a half weeks into the I process, agree. realizes the gravity, understands the gravity of where he is, and I think is willing to put aside the fact that someone trashed him nine months ago uh, when he was a candidate. He wants to make America great again and be strong on the world stage, and if he feels like Mitt I Romney's the guy to do it, then I, I do think he's putting these things aside and willing to listen, and I think that speaks I to hope the you're right. Can I make one more point about yeah. it? I do think that Donald Trump is showing in this transition process a willingness to make that big tent of the Republican Party yes. actually a real thing. Mm -hmm. And so let's say you're Donald Trump and you're thinking, okay, so I've got, I know I've got this strong base of support. There are some Republicans who are uncomfortable with me. What can I do to solidify a bigger tent so that I have the most support going forward for this presidency? And Bringing somebody like Tr Romney, and even if he doesn't choose them, I think that actually having him come by was well, worth it. Romney and he's has obviously a lot given to it offer. Some yeah, he yeah. has a lot to offer the country too, for sure. So why wouldn't you, if you're really sincere and genuine, and I believe that the president-elect is about unifying the country, about creating jobs, and doing the things he said he's going to do? You want to have the best. And regardless, time with you, it has neutralized Romney from criticizing him in the future. No, well, sure. I mean, it's the, yep. right, it's the right thing to do on all levels. So it's that remains smart. to be seen if, in fact, he's going to give him a position, Tom. Yeah, and you know what's interesting? The rules are different because we wouldn't be saying this about Rubio or Cruz because they were running against him. And the rules are different. Mm -hmm. And I think they're holding Romney to a different standard because he was calling him a fraud and a phony, but he wasn't running against him. But we, we seem to accept if you're running against someone, you can hit them hard, as Trump likes to say. Mm -hmm. and, so, and once Trump got the nomination, Romney didn't say another word, mm -hmm. as far as I remember. He also didn't lift a hand. I think uh, he that's did. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. I think true. he hit him hard during this. Uh, not during, not, I don't think afterwards. Not since the nomination? Yeah, but I think he maybe supported Evan McMullen in Utah. But other than that, you didn't see him on TV. He wasn't yeah, out there trying to act. There, there were tweets. There were some, he, he hit him with some... Uh, some I think nasty, nasty tone. That's and really like tough. Well, no, I think it was at the vulnerable moments, right? So videotape comes out, things yes. like that. He yeah. said things to kind of pile on in those processes. He wasn't yeah. the only one. Well, of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, there were strong supporters. Who but, if he, but, but if he does similar. end up going with Romney, then I think that sends an incredibly strong message exactly about what you said, Dana, right. which is that he wants to expand the tent. I hope he has that in him. It's not a Donald Trump that I think we've seen, the gracious Donald Trump that I have yet to see, but I, I, I the truly hope I'm right. The other thing is you saw this weekend that, uh, or it's not the, it's not the weekend yet. It felt like a weekend <laughs> yesterday. But the communication to the Japanese, which is to say, yeah, okay, well, the campaign was the campaign, and right. uh, the new NSA director, uh, Michael Flynn, is like, oh, that was just campaign talk. We're actually, we're good, Japan, and Japan is breathing a sigh of relief, and so everything's okay. So a moment of stability with our allies, if that means Mitt Romney helps in that regard, and they can help him, great. I don't think that means that Rudy wouldn't, or that somebody else that he chose wouldn't necessarily do that, but it is interesting how quickly they could go from very strong campaign rhetoric mm -hmm. too. Like we're good. Yeah. Well, like you said, once you have the job, what you see what what the situation is. Yeah. He's been getting the briefings, but, and he met with President Obama, and now it's time to time to govern and to unify. Well, we've also read about the, some concerns, though, that Mitt Romney's perspective on some issues of foreign policy are uh -huh. different than the like president. Russia. Russia. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. with a guy with that stature, with that known entity sure. out as your Secretary of State, you can get out in front of a president a little bit. We've seen that in other instances in history where Secretary of States are a little bit rogue or have right. a little bit of a different position. Well, with Hillary Giuliani, Clinton. you're probably exactly. She had a different position on Syria. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't know that until she writes her book after she left. And so you can 
have a different position but still carry through in the president's yeah. policy. Sure. And I want to get in the topic. But about if you disagree with it so much, then you have to resign. About so. Rudy Giuliani, because you know he was like right away the front runner for it. Obviously, Trump loyalists are very strong on him. We saw Newt uh, Gingrich's comments as well. Rudy's got an excellent background, a lot about foreign policy as well in terms of his experiences. So, uh, what do you think about that choice? I think that. He, that Donald Trump would be extremely comfortable with him. Yeah. But that might not necessarily be what Donald Trump is looking for. Maybe he does want to look for some challenges. Not that Rudy wouldn't necessarily provide um, policy challenges, and I think that he would be tireless in his efforts. I, th I think that the signals that they are getting from the Hill is that the confirmation process wouldn't necessarily be as easy as they'd like. Right, and I think if, if the president-elect had his choice and could make it happen, he would want to put Rudy in because he's been And I don't think Donald Trump's him. afraid of a fight with the Congress um, yeah. for some of these nominees. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to fight with for Sessions. some, like the Sessions probably won, yeah. although I think Sessions will probably be smoother than we think because yeah. he has a lot of good colleagues up there on the Hill from both sides of the aisle, including Chuck Schumer. But he is going to have to have, he's going to have several fights with the Democrats for example, his Supreme Court nomination. Mm -hmm. So how many fights do you... Basically, you pick your battles. Sure. Right? Sure. The art of he, war, we're going back to exactly. that. Exactly. So what do you think about the um, Giuliani? Giuliani, I think he'd be a strong choice. Mm -hmm. I, I, you may face some resistance in the Congress, but he's also going to have a lot of support as well. Might Potentially some Democrat support, some from moderate Democrats, um, and because they would acknowledge that elections have consequences, sure. and if this is who Trump wants as his Secretary of State, uh, it's time to abide by that. So I think he'd be a strong choice. Yeah, uh, I, I would sleep right well there. at night, I'll tell you that much. Yep. I know him very well for many years. All right. Fox confirming President-elect Trump has taken advantage of only two daily classified intelligence briefings since winning the election more than two weeks ago. But future Vice President Mike Pence has received the president's daily brief almost every day. U.S. officials saying each president-elect approaches these intelligence updates differently. So how typical is Mr. Trump's strategy? Let's bring in Lynn Sweet, the Washington bureau chief for the Chicago Sun-Times, and Tammy Bruce, radio talk show host and Fox News contributor. Welcome to you both on the Hi. Friday after Thanksgiving. A lot to get to here. Welcome, ladies. As a refresher, these briefings are made available to newly elected presidents well before Inauguration Day to help them have a deeper understanding of foreign developments. So with with Mr. Trump's level of national security experience going into the job, many are curious why he isn't taking full advantage of these briefings. Lynn, let's start with you. What do you think? Well, I think that if you're going to be talking to the to foreign leaders, which he's doing just this morning, his campaign said he talked to uh, the leaders of Greece, Panama, Slovakia, and Sweden. If you're going to be talking about foreign policy, it would seem if you have no background in, mil in the military, national security, then take advantage of what's offered you. One, one of the things about these briefings it is can be tailored to the person who's getting them. So I don't know what the right number is to, well, probably doesn't seem enough at this stage. All right. Uh, and Tammy, when you look at some of the historical perspective, in 2008, Obama took part um, and even in the deep dive briefings, which are on key subjects. George W. Bush uh, took the briefings every day. Bill Clinton, his first brief, November 13th, uh, you know, uh, in 1992, that's when he took his first one. What do you think as far as the timing? Because some will take them later. Well, yes, and look, uh, all of the media at this point, when it comes to the transition, has had it be a drama. It's been a negative point of view about what he's doing wrong. It's never really just about an informational framework about what uh, the president-elect and how he's approaching things. But what we do know is when you talk about taking the brief, I can tell you that President Obama, according to the Government Accountability Office, only participated in about 42 percent of the personal daily briefing. It doesn't mean that he's not getting the packet. And it's the same with, with pre the president-elect. He might not be going somewhere for the one-on-one -on -one daily briefing of someone telling him what's going on. As you mentioned, uh, the vice president-elect is doing that. But it doesn't mean that, uh, that Mr. Trump is not being briefed or is not being advised or isn't reading about the nature of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have to keep that in mind. But of course, the media, and this is the issue, wouldn't suggest that. They wouldn't think about, well, he's getting a packet. He's just not being talked at by a particular official. So he's also, keep in mind, of course,
just bringing in a businessman's approach to this dynamic about delegating. Someone is there on a daily basis in the form of the vice president-elect, and he's also getting briefed, or at least certainly getting the information uh, in a form to where he's going to read it when it's, when it's convenient. So uh, this is where, for the media, it's difficult because the American people think that he's just off playing golf somewhere. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I think they're finding that what they hear from the media might not always be the most accurate thing these days. All right, I've got to go shortly. Lynn, uh, your take on that really quick. I mean, as we move forward, we could be hearing more. Well, my take on that is that the media writ large has been uh, doing a lot of uh, very routine coverage. I respectfully disagree with Ms. Bruce. Uh, we had uh, almost a, there's a uh, camera on every meeting uh, that, uh, that Trump had with people throughout the last weekend of his okay. meeting people at his you know, Gulf Resort, New Jersey. So I think there's I a massive leave amount there, of coverage. Lynn, I'm so sorry. Lynn, Tammy, thank you so much for joining us today. Israeli police rounding up a dozen people and arresting them on suspicion of arson. This as a series of wildfires rage across the northern and central areas of the country, destroying property and forcing thousands of people to evacuate. Israeli's prime minister calling the fires acts of terrorism. We're facing arsonist terror. In front of arsonist terror, we are also facing incitement and also arson. For us, they are the same. And we will bring our full legal force to get those responsible. And joining me now is Chris McKinley, a former U.S. Navy SEAL, also CEO and founder of the Invictus Group. Uh, Chris, good to have you here this morning. Um, good morning. Uh, you know, listen, before, thank you, before, uh, because dozens have already been, you know, rounded up, it caused a lot of damage, as we just reported. Uh, still, they caught, they were caught relatively quickly. Do you, do you think this means that they're less likely to try this again, or do authorities need to remain on high alert. I mean, this is not the first time. No, it certainly isn't the first time. Matter of fact, there was a, a massive fire that was unintentionally set in 2010, and that spiraled with intentional arson events. Uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu has called them now pyro terror events, which I think is you know a very very uh, good term. You know, uh, Israel is besieged on all sides by people who want to wipe them off the map. So it's not. Uh, outside the realm of, of possibility to have you know, arsons in the past, arsons currently going on in, in the future for them as well. Uh, thankfully, uh, out of that 2010 tragedy, they were able to institute a pretty robust aerial fire service that was commissioned in May of 2011. And the U.S. is sending a super tanker currently right now that has a 20,000 uh, gallon capacity. You know, that old expression, never let a, a tragedy go to waste. So I think other, other countries are getting involved, uh, Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, uh, Italy. So, you know, uh, Israel's in a tough spot. We, we know that. They've been in a tough spot for a long time. And we've seen some of these fires in and around the main uh, number three big city in Israel, Haifa, as well as some other moshavs that are like these religious farming communities uh, that are settlement communities. So it's not... It's not uh, outside the realm of possibility to realize that you know some of those communities were in areas that were once once Palestinian controlled and uh, you know it's it's a it's a tinderbox no pun intended so you know uh, president-elect Trump says that he would love to make an Israel Palestine deal uh, his son-in-law Jared Kushner could help he thinks mm -hmm. is uh, you know achieve that goal as special envoy to the Middle East I mean wh what do you think could the Trumps achieve that you know, it is certainly something that I would like to see, and I think that uh, many people would like to see. You know, Kirshner, uh, his, his father was a, a very well-accomplished real estate mogul in his own right, and certainly being an American Jew is very, very helpful. Uh, I think the world is looking to America now to set a new tone, a tone of strength, a tone of tolerance and also a continued tone of help. I mean, we, we send massive relief and aid efforts all over the world. And we never ask for anything in return other than people play nice and play fair and let's make you know, this whole world great again. So I think in keeping with Make America Great Again, I think uh, for, for President-elect Trump to do that with his son-in-law would be a pivotal, move, a pivotal move. I think it would be great, great for everyone.